General Haberger will speak on the record, and he has some opening remarks about his recent uh, trip uh, to Moscow and uh, around Russia, and then he'll take some questions. General Haberger. Thanks. Well, some of you, I think, were here uh, when I, I spoke here uh, in November about my trip to uh, two missile bases, which occurred in October of last year. Uh, I went to a, a road mobile uh, ICBM complex at uh, uh, Tokovo, uh, about 150 clicks northeast of uh, Moscow, and then the next day I went to Kostroma, which is a rail mobile base. And uh, that's where the Russians, for the first time, ever took a non-Soviet, non-Russian into a nuclear weapons storage site. And I talked to you about what I saw, uh, the, uh, the, the approach the Russians take, uh, their very conservative approach. Uh, we have a two-person policy in this country. They have a three-person policy in their country. The <clears throat> level of security, uh, they have a, si a system similar to ours called a personnel reliability program. We call it a personnel reliability program to ensure that the people that have access to nuclear weapons or the critical components of nuclear weapons uh, are, uh, uh, have the right kind of uh, background checks and, and uh, are not uh, abusers of alcohol or drugs or that sort of thing. And what I'd like to do is kind of give you an update. I, thanks to uh, the efforts of my boss, the Secretary of Defense, and his direct uh, uh, discussions with Marshal Sergeyev, uh, I spent uh, just uh, a week or so ago, uh, six days in Russia, and the six-day period I went to five uh, nuclear uh, storage sites, five uh, major facilities in, in Russia. Uh, first stop was to uh, Kosolts, which is a uh, SS-19 ICBM uh, silo-based system, uh, approximately 200 kilometers uh, southwest uh, of Moscow. Uh, I did not go to a weapon storage area there, but what they wanted me to show me was how they guard their individual silos. Now, what you, a little bit of background for you. When I had uh, General uh, Yakovlev back visiting me in March of this year, I took him not only to an ICBM base, but I took him to one of our Navy bases so he could see how the United States Marine Corps guards our nuclear weapons at our Navy bases. And then the bomber commander, uh, General uh, Mikhail uh, Oparin, O-P-A-R-I-N, uh, I had General Ford, Phil Ford, my bomber task force commander, take General Oparin to uh, our bomber bases to show how we guard nuclear weapons there. The idea was to set the stage at some later point where I could go back and, and they'd reciprocate, and that's exactly what happened this trip. So, Kazoltz SS-19 went to see the, uh, they had a silo open for me, an operational ICBM uh, with six warheads on board, and uh, they took me to the silo. Uh, as I said, showed me the missile, took me to the launch control facility, showed me the crew members on duty. Uh, every question was answered very, very open, showed me how they maintain security, and the Russian approach is a little different than ours, and that. Uh, we uh, rely a lot on, on uh, technology. We don't have guards stationed at each of our 500 or so silos in the United States. The Russians have uh, two uh, security members on duty at every silo, uh, and that's, uh, that's a radical difference from the way we operate here in this country. Uh, what I saw at uh, Kosolts was, was impressive. Uh, security was, uh, was excellent. From there we went, and this was revolutionary, they took me to uh, Saratov, S-A-R-A-T-O-V, uh, to a national uh, nuclear weapon storage site where I saw not only strategic weapons but tactical weapons. I saw a lot of non-Luger uh, influence in terms of the fencing we supplied them, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, high-tech uh, sensors that are on the, uh, the fences. Uh, and they took me in to the, uh, the side of a, a mountain, a hill, where uh, they uh, took me behind two doors that were each uh, several uh, thousands of tons uh, in weight, and you had to open up one door at a time, these uh, sliding massive doors, in order to get into the inner sanctum. And in the inner sanctum, there were five uh, uh, nuclear weapon storage bays. They took me into one of those bays, and. Uh, uh, we had interesting discussion, uh, completely open. Uh, General uh, uh, Valinkin is the commander of the 12th Directorate on the general staff, and this is uh, a new bit of information, which I did not know until I went to Russia. But on the 1st of April, General Valinkin uh, took over responsibility for all 
Russian naval nuclear weapons. On the 1st of May, he took over responsibility for all Air Force nuclear weapons. And it appears that uh, before the year's out, uh, he will probably take over control of all the, the rocket force nuclear weapons. Uh, I, when I asked him why he was going to do this, uh, take over this additional responsibility, he said, our security is good, but we're going to make it better. And we're going to standardize our security and safety processes, and that's exactly what he's doing. This guy, Valenkin, is a no-nonsense kind of guy. He started his career in the, the missile forces. Uh, he told me that he's been in the job a little less than a year, and he's taken on a, a, a procedure whereby he personally interviews every uh, officer who comes on board working with nuclear weapons. And I said, ah, oh, sounds like Rickover. And he didn't have a clue who Rickover was, but uh, same kind of approach. Uh, he is, uh, is a perfect guy to, to take on this responsibility. Uh, at uh, Saratov, at the national site, uh, it's a closed uh, cantonment area. There are about 3,500 people that live in this area. About 1,200 or so are military. The rest are dependents and children. Uh, the, uh, it is closed. The, the, the commander, a colonel, uh, is the one that gives permission to people to go off the facility. They're completely self-contained schools, hospitals. Uh, the, uh, General Valenkin was very proud to tell me that uh, in order to maintain the very high standards for the children, I saw lots of children, that uh, he pays the teachers at his national sites three times the going rate of teachers uh, in most other places in the, in the country. Uh, from there, from Saratov, we went to Ingalls, a bomber base. At Ingalls, uh, I went into the nuclear, and let me back up to Saratov. Uh, while I was there, they, they demonstrated how they'd use their security forces to repel a, a terrorist attack. And uh, the use of helicopters, armored personnel carriers, uh, uh, was it rehearsed? You bet. Uh, same kind of thing I put my people f uh, through before I sent them to a, uh, uh, send a, a high roller uh, to one of my bases. Uh, but uh, they, they did it uh, very well. Uh, helicopter gun chips uh, were used, and then they had uh, uh, about a dozen uh, of their security forces jump out of one of the troop carrying helicopters from about an altitude of six feet and roll over and take part in the exercise. From Saratov went to Ingalls, uh, which was about uh, 30 kilometers away. The bomber base, they took me in the weapons storage site area there. Uh, again, I was, I was shown everything, shown the security, shown the closed circuit uh, TV cameras, uh, shown how they use a process of uh, uh, three-person control, and, uh, and uh, uh, General uh, Valinkin made it a point that at his national facilities, it's four-person control. You have to have three people who are knowledgeable of the tasks they're about to uh, engage in, plus uh, a, one of their supervisors to go along with them. Uh, bomber uh, facility, uh, ver very large uh, geographically, uh, and uh, extensive use, as I said, of uh, uh, closed-circuit television. Uh, entry control procedures were very, very tight. And then they, they took me into the uh, innermost bunker where they uh, uh, demonstrated how the, the massive doors that guarded the storage bunkers, uh, which were uh, rolled back on, on, on steel uh, wheels that uh, rolled on a, a steel embedded track. They put a Kopec down and to show me this was about the size of a nickel before they wrote. This is kind of one of these gee whiz kind of things. Watch us put the coin. You know, we used to do it as kids with railroads. Uh, rail cars, but they showed me in their nuclear storage facility. Uh, from Ingalls, went out to Irkutsk, uh, out in the uh, Baikal region, where I went to another SS-25 uh, road mobile base. They took me to a nuclear weapons storage area there. Again, uh, the security was, uh, was tight, uh, rigorous, and uh, uh, in many cases, much like the way we operate here in the United States. Uh, then uh, Friday night back to uh, Moscow, uh, just in time to get four hours sleep, which was the norm for this trip. Uh, and the next morning, Saturday morning, we went up to uh, Severomorsk, where we went to a nuclear weapons storage site there. I met with the commander in chief of uh, the Northern Fleet, uh, General Yeyev, uh, who was uh, another no-nonsense kind of guy. And uh, again, they took me into a nuclear weapons storage site. Uh, the kinds of things I saw, uh, uh, only officers work on nuclear weapons in Russia. We rely uh, heavily on our non-commissioned officers. Our officers are more in leadership positions than they are in technical positions. 
the uh, their their people who work on nuclear weapons are are uh, they don't move don't move around a lot. As a matter of fact, at uh, uh, Saratov, uh, I talked to one colonel, talked to two colonels. One of the colonels at Saratov had been there for 27 years. The other had been there for 25 years. And uh, that uh, uh, shows you that there's uh, a great deal of stability there. Uh, General uh, Valenkin told me that uh, I, I knew from a previous trip that folks who uh, are missile crew members who pull alert or who work on nuclear weapons get a base, uh, a base play plus a 25 percent bonus. Uh, Valenkin said that in his 12th directorate, his people, and he's got about 30,000 people, General uh, Valenkin does in the 12th directorate, his people that deal directly with nuclear weapons uh, until recently got base play plus a 30 percent bonus, commanders got base play plus a 35 percent bonus, and Valenkin said he recently uh, gained approval for all of his people uh, to be paid at base pay plus a 50 percent bonus. Uh, observations, many similarities. Uh, uh, at every nuclear weapon storage site I went into, I received a, a briefing that I could have taken from Francis E. Warren uh, Air Force Base and, and just translated into Russia. It was, at, uh, it was uh, very, very similar. Uh, we, as I mentioned to you when I was here in November, tend to use technology a heck of a lot more than the Russians do. They're still very manpower intensive, but uh, uh, that's working for them. Uh, the consolidations uh, uh, that I talked to you about, about General Valenka and the 12th Directorate kind of taken over, uh, I, I, I asked several questions. You know, was, was there some precipitating act that caused this transfer? And the answer I got, no, just want to standardize uh, the procedures. And uh, obvious concern at all levels with the safety and security of their nuclear weapons stockpile. Uh, it uh, was a very revealing trip. They were very open in every respect. And at no time was that I ask a question and then not uh, have a, uh, a very thorough uh, answer. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes, ma'am. What, what do you worries you the most about Russian nuclear weapons programs and security? What still concerns you? Uh, at this particular point, uh, I don't have any serious concerns. Uh, I see some things they can improve upon. But, but uh, and it's a very give and take kind of environment. Uh, as I mentioned to you when I was here in, our, in November, uh, I said we were going to have an exchange of security experts and we were going to have a shadow program. And the security experts, they were going to send a, uh, 10 or so experts over here, which they did in, uh, in April. Uh, two of them were from the 12th. Directorate and eight were from the rocket forces, and I took them to not only uh, Francis E. Warren, but I took them to uh, uh, Bangor, Washington, to uh, see how we do it in the Navy. And uh, as we were walking out of the the uh, nuclear storage facility at the Navy base up at uh, Severomorsk, uh, I was kind of harassing my good buddy General uh, Lincoln about you know, how this fence line was going up the side of a steep cliff, and, you know, uh, at, that was kind of a, a, a tough place to lay fences, and just kind of giving him a hard time in a, in a joking manner. And then he immediately comes, comes back to me and says, well, yeah, you, you may criticize that, but he says, uh, you do some things in the United States I'd never even think about doing. Uh, he said, uh, some of the procedures you, you use. So there's been a, a, a give and take here, and, and specifically he was referring to the fact that uh, we, under very heavy guard, uh, take uh, uh, at some of our bases contractors into our nuclear weapon storage areas uh, and to cut grass to do the, the maintenance. And, and uh, of course, uh, the Russians aren't terribly in, and this is not a, a, a slam dunk to my good Russian friends, but they're not much into uh, grass cutting. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh, General. Uh, you know, there have been a number of horror stories uh, about the Russian economy, about segments of the military not getting paid. Uh, so uh, is the standard of living uh, in, the, uh, in the nuclear forces, rocket forces, et cetera, has that really been maintained? Are those yes. people content? Uh, from what I've seen, it, it's content. They are content. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are two elements of the Russian military that appear to be uh, better off than, than others. The, the first is the, their uh, nuclear forces, and the second is their uh, airborne forces. They appear to be putting more emphasis on two, those two aspects. The biggest th problem the Russians have, and, and we've discussed this at length with them, 
is a critical shortage of housing. That is a very, very real problem with them. And General uh, 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 Valinkin mentioned that uh, he was short uh, 2,000 housing units, and General Yakovlev mentioned to me that on the neighborhood of 15 to 17,000 units short. And a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, the, the, when they brought back the missile forces from the Ukraine and Belarus and Kazakhstan, they had to bring back into Russia. They had, didn't have the money for housing. Uh, the, uh, the Russians have, have brought their bombers back from Mozdok and uh, uh, put them at, uh, at, uh, uh, at Ingalls, and they needed housing. Uh, so that's a very critical issue. And, and I, we're working very hard, perhaps, hopefully, to get some support to uh, uh, perhaps get some non-Luger money. This is a very contentious issue because uh, uh, there are some folks uh, on the Hill that would uh, d would not have us spend that money on, on something like housing. I take it you're completely personal, personally convinced as to the integrity of those Russian officers. Yes. As, as much as I am content with the integrity of the officers we have. Uh, as much? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're talking about uh, a, a, a core of professionals, and I don't, you know, in, in, in virtually in most nations, your officer corps is the, the seed corn of your country in terms of maintaining your, uh, your, uh, your government. And so you, you, you've got to put some confidence in them or otherwise you're on very shaky ground. Okay. Elaine, how are you? Good to see you. Do you enjoy my pen? <laughs> very much so, sir. Okay. Um, are you assuming from your trip that what you were shown is really the best that the Russians have to offer in terms of their security over nuclear forces? And if so, how far do you think the spectrum goes in terms of lesser security over no, those that's, same that's a good, forces? fair question. Uh, the way I would answer that is that, you know, when I was here last time, I got beat up by you all saying, well, you only saw one base. And, and I said, remember, I said, yeah, I saw one base, but I was told that was representative of the other uh, 19 or so uh, missile bases in Russia. Uh, they, uh, they told me what I saw was representative, uh, but uh, I, will, I don't want to quote the individual by name, but uh, one of the senior officers I talked to said, when I asked him that very specific question, am I seeing the best? He said, you're seeing a little bit of the best. You're seeing most of what's in the mainstream. And he said, there are some that are worse but not much worse. So they're very candid in that regard. Were you able to make any surprise visits anywhere or see anything that was a little bit <coughs> shaky in terms of their security? Uh, no. Uh, we, uh, again, I don't want to mention any names, but I, when they took me down into the, the, uh, the launch control facility of the, uh, at uh, Kassoltz, the, uh, <laughs> the general I was with hit the wrong button. And so we went somewhere we weren't supposed to go. And I was impressed with what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and I, let me just, the, 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 one of the reasons why I think we've done so well with the Russians is that our relationship, at least at my level, is based upon just open, you know, uh, very frank dialogue. And, and, and uh, uh, it's not one of these things where you probe uh, trying to get, you know, answers to, to, to uh, technical questions. For example, uh, General Valenkin, when he took me into uh, a number of the storage sites, said, okay, which, which one of these things do you want me to open up? And I said, I don't want you to open up any of them. You know, I, I, I see the, you know, you, you've explained the external security of the containers. You've shown me the, the, uh, the safety wire. You've shown me the two lead seals that are in, that imprinted with the, the symbol of the two officers that, that seal that, that, uh, that uh, container. I, I don't need to see what's in there. And uh, that's the kind of trust uh, we've built. And hopefully, uh, I've, I've uh, personally invited General Lincoln uh, to come to this country soon uh, so he can personally see how we do business. I think it's very, uh, uh, a very good thing to do. And uh, uh, Admiral uh, uh, Yorofeyev from the Northern Fleet, uh, Commander Chief up there, I've invited he and his wife to come also. And I hope we can get that done shortly. Jamie? Um, first of all, can you put the rest, and I apologize, I was in and out of the briefing, so if you touched on this, please tell me. But can you put the rest, uh, finally, this um, contention that there might be some suitcase-sized nuclear weapons of, uh, missing from the Russian nuclear arsenal? What degree of confidence do you have about the assurances you've received? I've, I have a very, very high level of confidence. And I've, I've uh, talked about that in October, and uh, I was told no in certain terms that uh, uh, this, is, this is not an issue. Uh, <coughs> They, they go to great lengths to uh, uh, ensure accountability for the nuclear weapons. 
uh, the security uh, to get into the facilities is uh, is significant uh, in in some cases. Uh, and I, when I say when I compare the United States and Russia, don't get me wrong. When I when I say that in some cases it's more difficult to get in Russian facilities, I'm not saying that U.S. facilities are it's easy to get into. But when you talk about two 100-ton doors to get through to get into a national weapons site, uh, that's pretty significant. The United States is now talking to the to the Chinese government about possibly detargeting missiles, something that we've already done with, uh, with Russia. Could you just talk a little bit about whether and that, is that a, how important is, is detargeting? Is it largely symbolism or is it, a, is it a important confidence building? It, I underscore importance confidence building. It's, uh, uh, it's the right thing to do. And uh, I, I'd like, prefer not to get into a lot of discussion there because I know it's something that's being worked over in the White House. but. Uh, it's worked very well with the Russians. Uh, they feel very comfortable with that. Uh, uh, I, a little vignette for what it's worth. In December, I invited a, 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 someone from the far right to come uh, to our headquarters uh, and spend a, a day, and he did. Uh, he writes in the Washington Times from time to time. And it, my agenda with him was to convince him that uh, we hadn't sold the farm, and I think we did a fairly good job there. And then in January, mid-January, I, uh, I invited uh, uh, Bruce Blair and uh, some of his colleagues and spent a day with them. And uh, I, I invited uh, Jeremy Stone from the Federation of American Scientists to come out and uh, uh, to show them what we're doing, uh, the kind of confidence building to, con to hopefully, I didn't convince them uh, for a lot of obvious reasons, but to, to kind of put in perspective uh, some of these uh, notions of hair trigger, which uh, are just not true. But, so the critics say uh, it's meaningless because the missiles can be retargeted so quickly or that it's militarily insignificant. Well, the, uh, uh, the Russians will tell you that it takes in excess of 10 minutes for them to uh, put the target sets into the missiles. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, they, uh, the, uh, there, there are four or five positions, depending on the, the missile that uh, you have to put a switch in, uh, and then there's a, a zero position, which is the no target position. And from the time they go from the no target, the, 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 the uh, zero position to one of the target sets, it, it takes in excess of 10 minutes. As a matter of fact, when uh, one of the uh, delegations that I just mentioned visited, uh, we had a big discussion about hair trigger and this notion of that you're talking about, Jamie, about getting the you know, hair trigger tens of seconds, less than 10 seconds. I was able to pick up the phone uh, early the next morning and call uh, the chief of staff of the missile forces through an interpreter in the, the, the embassy in Moscow and, and talk to my good buddy, uh, uh, General Lada, who's the chief of staff, and I said, uh, okay, uh, Vasily, uh, what's, the, what's the answer? How long does it take you to put the, uh, uh, the, the uh, coordinates in? And, and I said, if you can't answer, I understand, but I've got this visitor here, and I need a no kidding answer. And he said, well, hey, General Hagler, it takes more than 10 minutes. And I said, thank you very much. That's what my people told me. And then uh, I was able to go back to this individual who was visiting uh, for breakfast and say, hey, I've just talked to the chief of staff of the Russian rocket forces, and this is what he told me. How many uh, missiles have you actually witnessed that have been detargeted? Well, everyone I've seen has been detargeted. Uh, approximately how many would that be? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, on this trip, I saw uh, I saw an SS-25 on alert at uh, Okrutsk. I saw that SS-19 on alert at uh, Kaselsk. Uh, and then uh, what I didn't mention is when I was at uh, the Naval uh, Northern Fleet headquarters at uh, Syromorsk, uh, they brought a Delta IV sub for me to crawl around for an hour, which was uh, very interesting. Let me go through the whole sub, and except for the engine compartment. Did they let you see the warheads uncased? Uncased warheads? Uh, they did at uh, Kostroma last year. And, uh, yeah, and, I, and again, I, if I had asked, they would have done it this time. But again, I, the, the confidence building that we have at, at the military to military level is not to be probing, inspector, hey, let me see everything kind of thing. Yeah. Mr. General, the, uh, do you think you would have anything to gain by having a similar set of uh, exchanges with the Chinese military leadership at their strategic Yes. And, and we've attempted to pursue that and have not been very successful. And we hope to uh, 
uh, assuming that uh, things work out uh, in uh, July, we will re-engage with the, the Chinese and, and see if we can uh, uh, get a dialogue going. That's very, very important. Haven't the Chinese and have the Chinese rejected the the offer of detargeting? Uh, I'm not aware of, of of any rejection or acceptance. Uh, I know it's something being discussed in the White House. Yes, sir. The uh, the cons consolidation you mentioned earlier, putting the the naval, the air force, and the rocket forces under a, a single person. How significant is that in your view? And does that sort of mirror your role? In many ways, I mean, uh, uh, yes, it does. Uh, it uh, uh, the uh, I'm not saying that they did that because of us, but having one person who that's all they worry about are nuclear weapons is probably the right thing to do. Uh, General Yakovlev, for example, uh, uh, at the end of last year. Not only uh, did he have his uh, nominal responsibilities as a commander in chief of the Russian uh, missile forces, but he picked up the responsibility of being commander in chief of their space uh, activities. So he's got a lot in his platter. Yes, ma'am. Just out of curiosity, when you met with all of these uh, Russian generals, was there any discussion in, the, in their views about what's going on with India and Pakistan? Yes. Did you generally hear from them? Uh, generally, the same concerns I have that it's very destabilizing that part of the world. Uh, that uh, and if obviously uh, 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 India is a heck of a lot closer to, to Russia. Uh, a consensus, if you will, that uh, the uh, the explosion of a of a laboratory device in a, in a in a tunnel is a heck of a lot different than an operational miniaturized warhead uh, uh, that has all the built-in safety features you would expect. Uh, the point I'm trying to make to you is that uh, just because the Indians and the Pakistanis uh, detonated nuclear devices, uh, 12 of them over a, you know, 20-day period, which is historical. That uh, there's a big difference, big leap of faith between that exploding a, a laboratory device and a, an operational. So, actually, what's your view on all of that at the moment? I mean, do you how do you view them as? Do you view both those countries as nuclear powers now? Uh, my own professional view, yeah. no. I mean, they, neither of them. They, they have exploded nuclear devices. Does that make a country a nuclear power? That's a rhetorical question. Do, uh, are you concerned about the uh, level of safeguards uh, that are in place in India and Pakistan? You described the elaborate systems in, uh, in the United States and Russia. Is there anything like that in terms of India and Pakistan, in terms of safeguarding nuclear weapons material? Uh, I. I've really not gotten into that, Jamie. Uh, the, uh, I know that uh, there is massive amounts of security that went around uh, uh, the Pakistani uh, uh, facilities just before their detonations. Uh, and uh, let me just say this. Uh, the, Ch the Indians and the, and the Pacs uh, have some pretty elaborate uh, security around their, their uh, facilities that deal with uh, fizzle material. Yeah. Um, could, what's uh, the status of the SS-27 uh, fleet as, as it may exist right now, and what, what do you see happening here? Yeah, year? I see the uh, the uh, 27 replacing the the uh, uh, some of the 18s. You know, uh, the SS-18 has 10 warheads. The SS-27 uh, is operational. They've got two of them deployed. Uh, Minister Sergeyev and General Yakovlev went out to uh, the Far East to. Uh, declare those uh, two silos operational. I, will, I, I would expect to see over the next several months uh, uh, more of the SS-27s be deployed. You can, these are two fully operational ones, or is one of them a training one? Uh, they're both operational. Both operational. Yes, sir. It takes in excess of 10 minutes for each side to retard these missiles. Some people think it might be a better idea to separately store the warheads and the missiles. Yeah. What do you say to that? And is there any uh, looking into that as a possible? Yeah. I've read Stansful Turner's book. Uh, I've talked to a number of people to help him write the book. Uh, here's where I'm coming from in this, uh, this, this arena. Uh, first of all, uh, the Cold War ended. We had 12,000 nuclear weapons staring each other in the face, each. Uh, we began a very stable, verifiable glide path to getting down to lower and lower numbers. Uh, start 
two, uh, start one where we're at now, 6,000 weapons, start two, which is coming. Uh, unfortunately, the Duma did not support uh, uh, debate this month, but has kicked the can till uh, the September timeframe. Uh, under start two, we'll be down to 3,3500. Start uh, three under the Helsinki Accords will get us down to 2,2500. You know, the, the ultimate goal of the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has been around for 30 years, and oh, by the way, the United States of America has ratified that treaty, is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. I mean, that's a goal. That's our policy. But if you read Article 6, it says, given the proper preconditions. Zero nuclear weapons given the proper preconditions. I don't think we'll ever see the proper preconditions. My point to you, though, is I as I talk to people like uh, Bruce Blair and Jeremy Stone and the Federation of American Scientists, is that, hey, Things are going well. Uh, you know, today we have probably about 2,300 nuclear weapons on uh, on alert, and we ought to get down lower numbers. Under Start Two, those numbers will get down to less than 1,000. Under Start Three, those numbers will be less than 700. So we're on a good, stable uh, uh, glide path. And to do something that is not ver verifiable, or if, if if verifiable, very intrusive. Uh, would have, uh, and also the potential for being destabilizing, because one of the things as you th think through the policy implications of the business that we're in, of deterrence, is that as you go to lower and lower nuclear lo levels of nuclear weapons, cheating takes on much greater leverage. And uh, I'm not saying, implicating that anybody's going out and cheat, but those are the kinds of things I think about on a daily basis. Yes, sir. The Russians have a different... Uh level of uh, security standard for tactical nuclear weapons, or is it the same for the same. strategic? Same. When General Butler um, uh, resigned, he gave, came to Washington and gave a speech in which he said he'd done a lot of soul searching and had, um, you know, he basically renounced uh, the efficacy of nuclear weapons. Uh, I guess you're coming toward the end of your uh, command. Have you had any similar uh, introspective <laughs> thoughts? And could you share? With us, your uh, thoughts yeah. about the. Uh, okay, I've had a religious experience this morning, JD. You're going to be the first to know. It wouldn't be the first time with <laughs> No, I'm, I'm just kidding you, obviously. Don't. Uh, uh, I've, I've had the job for two and a half years. I've gone to great, great lengths to make sure that I don't get into a public debate about uh, General Butler and, and his views. Uh, obviously, my views and his views are 180 degrees out. I disagree with his views uh, vehemently and. Uh, but he's entitled to his views. Yes. Does the U.S. intelligence community share your relatively sanguine view of uh, the level of command and control in Russia? Over there? Sanguine. <laughs> sanguine. <laughs> you have a, a bit of confidence. In, I do. In I do. And, and, and I, I have a bit of confidence because uh, I have, uh, I've been exposed to a great deal. Now, one of the things that I was very frustrated about when I got into the job is it took me uh, a year before I got uh, then Commander Chief for Rocket Forces Sergeyev over to, to visit. Uh, so as one year, and, and most commanders and chiefs are only in the job for two years, so half of my tenure was behind me when I first got this dialogue going. So to make sure we keep the momentum going, when I went on this most recent trip, I took my successor, uh, Admiral Rich Meese, uh, along with me, and he got to see everything I did. He's got to meet the people. And, and hopefully we'll continue this into the future, which is very, very important. It should not be a, personnel, a personality-driven uh, series of events. It should be a con continuous kind of process. Can the U.S. intelligence community share that view? Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, and, and, and uh, I'll probably get in trouble from the intelligence mafia, but uh, uh, they just haven't been exposed to this kind of stuff. So they disagree with you? No. <laughs> So you're, <laughs> you're terrible. <laughs> you know that? Well, I didn't understand your answer. Do they agree with you entirely, or do you have a difference of opinion with the intelligence community? I, they, 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 I, I don't think, uh, in most cases, they, they've been exposed to the level of detail that I have to disagree. So they're, they, they're not as knowledgeable. Yes, but I did want to say that. I mean, uh, <laughs> Intel, <laughs> Intel folks have a pretty big ego. So I used to be one, so I can say that. And how does that reflect in their estimates? Well, well they haven't. Uh, they have a lot of the things that they have been exposed to and have written have been based upon estimates, interpolations, uh, interpretations, and uh, you know, do I have the the the, the total 100 percent truth? Probably not, but I'm probably a hell of a lot closer than they are. Well, then I have to follow up one more time. Okay. My question then is, what is your assessment of the quality of U.S. intelligence about Russian 
nuclear forces? I, I, it's good. I, but I think because uh, so much of what is done in this arena, uh, you know, for example, the Suratov uh, uh, Sierra 1050, which is the name of the site I went to, uh, we had never had any access to anybody that had ever worked at one of those facilities that I'm aware of. And so for them to take me in there and show me the flats where the families live, to show me the school, to, you know, take me to the officers club and for a, for a meal to you know uh, to see 30 kids come running up never having seen an american before and a, a russian three star say hey look here's an american you've never seen one before uh and to take me into the uh, uh the areas where they have the uh, national bunkers uh, that's that's revolutionary there's been a lot of debate in washington uh, over the last couple of months about to what extent china's missile program has been aided by u.s technology and without getting into any classified or uh, information. Could you just give us generally an assessment of whether China's uh, missile capability is significantly greater today than it was, say, a few years ago? No. It's not? No. From my perspective. Could I, I'm talking about military intercontinental ballistic missiles. So is all this debate just a lot of hot air? Well, I don't, I'm not going to get into uh, debates and hot air. I, let, let me tell you that the the uh, CSS-4 uh, ICBM that uh, the, Rush, uh, the Chinese have deployed today has been uh, deployed since 1981. And there have been some modifications, but nothing significant. Let's, yes, if I could, with uh, your next question. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, another thought that came to mind is uh, in talking to all of these Russians, did you get into the subject of missile proliferation and the dangers and India, uh, Pakistan, Iran, Libya, et cetera, especially Russian collusion uh, 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 in missile proliferation. Are they as concerned about that as we are? Uh, we talked about uh, the, uh, the development of uh, missile technology in those countries. We did not, uh, I did not bring up the subject of, of uh, Russian uh, involvement in, in uh, potential proliferation. Our relationship is, is built, uh, my relationship is built upon you know, uh, I'm not afraid to ask the tough questions. By the same token, uh, uh, I, I don't go out with an ice pick uh, going for their eyes when, when, I, when I talk to them. Yes, sir. Okay. Gentlemen, we're, we're a technology-heavy type thing. They're manpower-heavy. But they still have a lot of uh, technology, obviously, guarding their sites. The year 2000 problems, are they, are they looking at that? And are you satisfied with their progress? And are you sharing some of the things that maybe you had? Yep, good question. Uh, in February, I accompanied the, the secretary over to Moscow for a meeting with uh, Marshal Sergeyev. I had an opportunity to sit down with General Yakovlev for about two hours and talk about his upcoming trip. And as we were going through his itinerary, uh, I asked him what he wanted to do. He said he was a tennis player, he wanted to play with play tennis with Pete Sampras. I said, probably could not set that up. Uh, he said he wanted to go swimming in the Pacific Ocean. I said, hey, I'm taking you to Vandenberg. We can do that. And as we were just chatting, I talked about El Nino because California and, and the, the, the tides. And then I, I said, you know, one of the things that's really worrisome to me because of the potential magnitude of the problem is the year 2000 problem. Uh, he was not uh, very familiar with this issue. Uh, in March, he came over, General Yakovlev did, and in a one-on-one -on -one session with me, he said, uh, thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. And then when I saw him uh, last week, uh, uh, we talked about it at some length, and he said that uh, he does not have any problems in his nuclear command and control with the year 2000, but they're still working the, the periphery systems. Yes, sir. General, if I could go back to the proliferation question, is it your opinion that that the Russian military leadership either acknowledges or is involved in the uh, proliferation of the technology? I've seen, I have seen no indication of that. Yes, sir. I'll start two questions. What is your assessment of the Duma's uh, postponing hearings again on start two? Um, did you all talk about that yeah. and the prospects for um, getting to some smaller numbers? And what's your, what's your gauge of their of Russia's intention towards its nuclear forces? Are they putting most of their eggs in that basket? Yep. Uh, well, let me let, not, not just say yep. Uh, <laughs> as I mentioned right up front, uh, if you look at where they're spending their money, it's in nuclear forces and, and the airborne forces. Uh, the sensing I got in my discussions uh, with, with, and again, I don't want to quote a specific individual, but with a uh, senior military official that I talked with on the trip, is that 
The Duma have, has three major hang-ups with, uh, with START II uh, at this particular point in time. Number one, uh, perceptions about uh, ABM uh, uh, activity in the United States. Number two, uh, our capability to break out uh, under uh, and upload our ICBMs with more than one warhead. And three, uh, uh, the ensuring that the nuclear forces have stable funding. Those are the three primary concerns that were relayed to me as perceptions by the du of the Duma regarding SART II. And, and uh, uh, I'll just relay them to you as I heard them. Yes, sir. If there's so much trust between both sides, why is it the United States can't get more visibility into the Yamantau Mountain Complex and other similar construction projects that are underway and closely tied to their command and control of nuclear forces? Uh, excellent question. Uh, again, I don't want to identify anyone by name, but uh, another senior official, a very senior official, uh, uh, and I had a, a discussion, and that's one of the issues I, I brought up. I said, hey, we've got folks in the United States who think you, you're committing a technical foul by, you know, the, you got 20,000 people working there, you got uh, uh, you got some a lot of resources going in this place. Why don't you just take an American down there and show them what you're doing? And he said, "Got it. I don't know what's going to happen." Did they tell you what it was all about? Uh, yes, it's the same uh, story that I got from John Sergeyev uh, uh, over a year ago, and the uh, uh, it is not military related. It is uh, a national crisis center, is the way it was described to me. But I said you need to put it to bed. One more question right there. Yeah. Uh, when you were here last time, you mentioned that uh, one of the active modernization programs, long range, that's uh, going on is the, uh, the continued development of a cruise missile, a long range cruise missile. Any any update on that? No. Uh, I, uh, I yes. The update is that uh, uh, there's not as much activity as I thought I would see in that development program. Yeah, I think so. The 15 is still good. The S15, which uh, they use on their blackjacks and their bears, their T-160s and T-95s. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Thank you very much General. Thank you.